first private talk with, I am terrified of public speaking. So I don't know how BJ talked me through this. I think he said it was because it was related to that moment I'm in. <laughs> My name is Shane Elizabeth Lohr, and I'm a recovering addict. But it's not what you think. I wasn't addicted to drugs or alcohol or gambling. I was addicted to my relationship. Codependency is defined in many ways. People who are codependent are often characterized as people who go out of their way to please others. They have poor boundaries, they feel they are responsible to save everyone, and they often search for internal value through external validation. Codependency is also known as love addiction. In fact, codependency often exists with addiction and can manifest in the form of a parent-child connection in friendships or in romantic relationships. Stanton Peel popularized this concept in the 70s saying love is the perfect vehicle for addiction because it exclusively claims a person's consciousness. To define something as addiction, it must be both reassuring and all-consuming. Being in a relationship with an addict is highly attractive to a codependent because the addict demands time, energy, and focus, which makes a codependent feel worthy when they can meet these demands. So imagine this, it's 3 a.m. and you wake up already anxious. You quickly reach over to see if your partner is still next to you. He's not, so you immediately panic. When you find out he's home, you feel stupid, controlling, out of control, but also relieved. Relieved, he's not dead. Imagine again it's two days later, 3 a.m., and the same thing happens, only this time, he's not home. You're calling him over and over again, texting and leaving voicemails you know he'll never listen to. You're panicking and thinking that the, the time is ticking and only you can save him. You hop in your car, you drive around town, and in the dead of winter, you do this because you are the only one who can talk to him. Only you can convince him to come back home and only you can keep him alive. Your biggest fear is that he's overdosed or is dead somewhere. So how did you, or should I say I, get here? Before I can answer that, I want to give a little bit of context as to how this all began. I met my partner at the age of 18. I was in a place where I felt very lost and very disconnected with the world around me. I didn't know how to nurture my inner child or love myself. He filled all the voice that I was missing. We went on to have one of the most supportive, loving, and healthy relationships. We got married and we had a dog named Dodger, and our families got along beautifully. My mom, who only speaks Hmong, and my husband, who only spoke English, somehow had the best communication. And at times, I felt like I was the third wheel. We would go on to have 14 years of memories and growth, and I don't regret any of it. So how did we get here? It started with little things. Hidden vodka bottles, white lies, small transactions of money. All things that could be explained away. Then years later, it grew into, hey honey, I'm gonna go run an errand, and then he's gone for three days. My bank account is empty, and my debit card is gone. We found ourselves in this toxic cycle. The more he avoided me, the more I invaded his space. The more he spiraled out of control, the more I felt I had to control him. The more he kept taking from me, the more I kept giving. And I gave, and I gave, and I gave. I thought that my love was somehow enough to stop him from drinking, from doing drugs, from lying, and from stealing. So over time, I began to slowly prioritize my needs, or his needs, over mine. I started to take on more and more so that he didn't have to take on anything, which in hindsight was harmful to the both of us. When we got married, we both vowed until death do us part, and I honestly meant that. Nobody knew I was living this way, not my coworkers, not my closest friends, not my family, because I was still operating at a very high level of functioning that was perfectionistic. I continued to hide his destructive behaviors 
and made excuses for him in exchange for love. So what changed? I was laying in bed, and at this point, we were financially broke and emotionally broken. We were both exhausted, defeated, and stuck in this cycle. I felt so alone. I hadn't slept for even days. It's 3 a.m., and I'm anxious. I reach over, and even though he was physically there, he was no longer the same person. And to me, he was dead. I was already grieving him. I had gone through all the stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, in that moment, acceptance. What I didn't realize until later, though, was I also died that day. And I would go on to grieve that shame, too. In fact, I still grieve her to this day. Until death was her. I watched a TED Talk with addiction therapist Candice Patter, and she said, the spotlight has always been on the addict, the drugs they're using, the problems they're causing. But the truth is, when you find an addict living in addiction, the chances are you're also going to find somebody who's enabling them, someone who's unaware they're contributing to the problem too. And just like that cool Taylor Swift song, I won't sing it, uh, it's me, hi. <laughs> I'm the problem, it's me. Enabling can look a whole lot like helping, especially when you're looking through the lens of love. Ironically, my biggest fear was that he was going to die, but I was actually the person loving him to death. Until death was hard. I was hurting him, I was hurting myself, and this was a toxic cycle of fear, enabling, and addiction. I was also an addict. This realization helped me to finally take the time to heal that inner child, to fill my own void, and to work on self-reliance and self-nurturance. And for the first time, I felt free. So if you're finding yourself in the same place that old Shane was in, remember that you are not alone. And it is okay to grieve that old part of you that needed to die so that a new you can be born. You don't have to go out of your way to please others. You can have healthy boundaries. You are not responsible for saving everyone. And if you keep doing your internal work, the external matters less. My name is Jane Elizabeth Lohr, and I may be a recovering addict, but I'm also so much more. Today, I'm an activist. I'm a creator. I'm a producer. I'm a social worker, and as of a month ago, I'm officially a business owner. So even in death, there is life. I'm healed, and I'm healing. And the most death-defying act I've ever done was to honor myself, show up for me, and love me the most. And instead of loving someone else to death, I learned how to love myself back to life. <laughs>